Hello listeners, this is the reading of the Sabbath School lesson for the fourth and final quarter of 2022. The series is titled On Death, Dying and the Future Hope. The author is Dr. Alberto Tim, while your readers are Percy and Sibylla Harold. Welcome to lesson number 13, ready for teaching on December 24. It's titled The Judging Process, and I'm Percy Harold. Sabbath afternoon, December 17. Before we start, let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you that people are listening to this reading of the Sabbath School lesson right round the world. And today I'd like to pray for those who are listening in Kiribati, those in Lesotho, those in Malawi or Malaysia or the Maldives or Malta or Mauritius or Montserrat or Mozambique or Namibia, those in the island nation of Nauru or New Zealand or Nigeria or Nui or on Norfolk Island. And if anyone's listening in Wabag in Papua New Guinea, May God bless you this week, because as we open God's word, we come to seek him and we thank him for his word, but we also thank him for what it tells us. And as we study about the judgment this week, we pray that your Holy Spirit, Lord, will be with us, that the words may affect our thinking, our hearts and the way we live. And may we be able to show your love to those about us as you show it to us. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Our memory text this week is 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 10. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, so that each of us may receive what is due us for the things done while in the body, whether good or bad. Let's read that again, 2 Corinthians 5 and verse 10. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, so that each of us may receive what is due us for the things done while in the body, whether good or bad. If scripture is clear about one thing, it is the reality of judgment. God will judge the world. The text, both in the Old Testament and the New, are numerous and without ambiguity. The justice so lacking here and now will one day come. The Bible says that God has perfect knowledge in Job 37.16 and knows everything in 1 John 3.20, including our most secret intentions, as we read in Ecclesiastes 12.14. For God will bring every work into judgment, including every secret thing with a good or evil, and Jeremiah 17.10, I, the Lord, search the heart, I test the mind, even to give every man according to his ways, according to the fruit of his doing. We can hide from everyone and everything else, but nothing is hidden from God. What this really implies is that he does not need a judgment for himself to know the life of each individual. God's judgments are, indeed, a divine accommodation carried on for the sake of his creatures, both in heaven and on earth. This process is of a cosmic historical nature, because Lucifer began his rebellion in heaven and then spread it to the world. As we read in Revelation chapter 12, verses 7 to 9, And war broke out in heaven. Michael and his angels fought with the dragon, and the dragon and his angels fought, but they did not prevail, nor was a place found for them in heaven any longer. So the great dragon was cast out, that serpent of old called the devil and Satan, who deceives the whole world. He was cast to the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. During this week, we will consider the end-time judgment process with its three main phases the pre-advent judgment, the millennial judgment, and the executive judgment. The whole process ends with the vindication of the righteous and the second death of the wicked.
Sunday, December 18, The Final Judgment For many, the idea of judgment means condemnation. And though that's part of the process, we mustn't forget that the idea of judgment has a positive side, in that judgment also involves the vindication of the righteous. Actually, the book of Daniel refers to an end-time judgment in favour of the saints of the Most High in Daniel 7.22. God's judgment includes both a principle found in this Old Testament text in 1 Kings 8.32. Then hear in heaven and act and judge your servants, condemning the wicked, bringing his way on his head, and justifying the righteous by giving him according to his righteousness. Read Matthew chapter 25, verses 31 to 36, and John 5, verses 21 to 29. How did Christ point to the concepts of both condemnation and vindication in the final judgment? Matthew 25, beginning at verse 31. When the Son of Man comes in his glory, and all the holy angels with him, then he will sit on the throne of his glory. All the nations will be gathered before him, and he will separate them one from another as a shepherd divides his sheep from the goats. And he will set the sheep on his right hand, but the goats on the left. Then the king will say to those on his right hand, Come, you blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me food. I was thirsty, and you gave me drink. I was a stranger, and you took me in. I was naked, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you visited me. I was in prison, and you came to me. Then the righteous will answer him, saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry, and feed you, or thirsty, and give you drink? When did we see you a stranger, and take you in, or naked, and clothe you? Or when did we see you sick or in prison and come to you? And the king will answer and say to them, Assuredly I say to you, inasmuch as you did it to one of the least of these, my brethren, you did it to me. Then he will also say to those on the left hand, Depart from me, you cursed, into everlasting fire prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry and you gave me no food. I was thirsty, and you gave me no drink. I was a stranger, and you did not take me in. Naked, and you did not clothe me. Sick and in prison, and you did not visit me. Then they also will answer him, saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry, or thirsty, or a stranger, or naked, or sick, or in prison, and did not minister to you? Then he will answer them, saying, Assuredly, I say to you, Inasmuch as you did not do it to one of the least of these, you did not do it to me. And these will go away into everlasting punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. And John chapter 5, verses 21 to 29. For as the Father raises the dead and gives life to them, even so the Son gives life to whom he will. For the Father judges no one, but has committed all judgment to the Son, that all should honour the Son, just as they honour the Father. He who does not honour the Son, does not honour the Father who sent him. Most assuredly I say to you, he who hears my word and believes in him who sent me, has everlasting life, and shall not come into judgment, but is passed from death into life. Most assuredly I say to you, the hour is coming, and now is, when the dead will hear the voice of the Son of God, and those who hear will live. For as the Father has life in himself, so he has granted the Son to have life in himself, and will give him authority to execute judgment also, because he is the Son of Man. Do not marvel at this, for the hour is coming in which all who are in the graves will hear his voice and come forth, those who have done good to the resurrection of life and those who have done evil to the resurrection of condemnation. Some claim that the expressions is not judged in John 3 verse 18 and will not be judged in verse 24 mean that those who are in Christ are not judged at all. But these expressions imply that believers are not condemned in the judgment. Hence, the text should be understood as saying, 
is not condemned in verse 18 and shall not come into condemnation in verse 24. In short, our destiny is determined in our present life. Those in Christ have their vindication at the judgment already assured, and those who are not in Christ remain under condemnation. Describing the judgment in Matthew 25, 31-46, which we've just read, Christ mentioned the presence not only of the goats, the wicked, but also of the sheep, the righteous. And the Apostle Paul stated explicitly, For all of us must appear before the judgment seat of Christ, so that each may receive recompense for what he has done in the body, whether good or evil. 2 Corinthians 5 verse 10 While reflecting on the judgment, we should keep in mind that we are saved by grace, justified by faith and judged by works. Saved by grace, we read in Isaiah 55 verse 1, Ho, everyone who thirsts, come to the waters, and you who have no money, come buy and eat, yes, come buy wine and milk, without money and without price. And Ephesians 2, beginning at verse 8, For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. And we are justified by faith, as you read in Genesis 15, verse 6, And he believed in the Lord, and he accounted it to him for righteousness. And Romans chapter 5, and verse 1. Therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. And judged by works, Ecclesiastes 12 and verse 14. For God will bring every work into judgment, including every secret thing, whether good or evil. And in Matthew 25 verses 31 to 36, we read the story of the sheep and the goats. And we continue with Revelation 20, verses 11 to 13. Then I saw a great white throne, and him who sat on it, from whose face the earth and the heaven fled away. And there was found no place for them. And I saw the dead, small and great, standing before God, and books were opened, and another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged according to their works, by the things which were written in the books. The sea gave up the dead who were in it, and death and Hades delivered up the dead who were in them, and they were judged, each one according to his works. The basis of the judgment process is God's moral law as summarised in the Ten Commandments, as you read in Ecclesiastes 12, verses 13 and 14. Let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God and keep his commandments, for this is man's all. For God will bring every work into judgment, including every secret thing, whether good or evil. And James 1 verse 25. But he who looks into the perfect law of liberty and continues in it, and is not a forgetful hearer but a doer of the work, this one will be blessed in what he does. And finally, James 2, verses 8 to 17. If you really fulfil the royal law according to the scripture, you shall love your neighbour as yourself, you do well. But if you show partiality, you commit sin and are convicted by the law as transgressors. For whoever shall keep the whole law and yet stumble in one point, he is guilty of all. For he who said, do not commit adultery, also said, do not murder. Now, if you do not commit adultery, but you do murder, you have become a transgressor of the law. So speak, and so do, as those who will be judged by the law of liberty. For judgment is without mercy to the one who has shown no mercy. Mercy triumphs over judgment. What does it profit, my brethren, if someone says he has faith, but does not have works? Can faith save him? If a brother or sister is naked and destitute of food, and one of you says to them, Depart in peace, be warmed and filled, but you do not give them the things which are needed for the body, what does it profit? Thus also faith by itself, if it does not have works, is dead. 
Our works are the external evidences of the genuineness of our saving experience and, consequently, the elements to be appraised during judgment. Remember, there is no arbitrary decree from God electing some to be saved and others to be lost. Each one is morally responsible for his or her own destiny. In the end, the judgment is not the time when God decides to accept or reject us, but the time when God finalises our choice as to whether or not we have accepted him, a choice made manifest by our works. Monday, December 19. The Pre-Advent Judgment The concept of judgment before the return of Christ, or what we call a pre-advent judgment, is found in many places in Scripture. Read Daniel 7, 9-14, Matthew 22, 1-14, Revelation 11, verses 1, 18 and 19, and Revelation 14, 6 and 7. How do these passages shed light on the notion of a pre-advent investigative judgment in the heavenly courtroom? What is the significance of such a judgment? Daniel 7, beginning at verse 9. I watched till thrones were put in place, and the Ancient of Days was seated. His garment was white as snow, and the hair of his head was like pure wool. His throne was a fiery flame, its wheels a burning fire. A fiery stream issued and came forth from before him. A thousand thousands ministered to him. Ten thousand times ten thousand stood before him. The court was seated, and the books were opened. I watched then because of the sound of the pompous words which the horn was speaking. I watched till the beast was slain and its body destroyed and given to the burning flame. As for the rest of the beasts, they had their dominion taken away, yet their lives were prolonged for a season and a time. I was watching in the night visions, and behold, one like the Son of Man coming with the clouds of heaven. He came to the Ancient of Days, and they brought him near before him. Then to him was given dominion and glory and a kingdom, that all peoples, nations and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion, which shall not pass away, and his kingdom the one which shall not be destroyed. And Matthew 22 Beginning at verse 1, And Jesus answered and spoke to them again by parables, and said, The kingdom of heaven is like a certain king who arranged a marriage for his son, and sent out his servants to call those who were invited to the wedding, and they were not willing to come. Again he sent out other servants, saying, Tell those who are invited, See, I have prepared my dinner, my oxen and fatted cattle are killed, and all things are ready. Come to the wedding." But they made light of it and went their ways, one to his own farm, another to his business. And the rest seized his servants, treated them spitefully, and killed them. But when the king heard about it, he was furious, and he sent out his armies, destroyed those murderers, and burned up their city. Then he said to his servants, The wedding is ready, but those who were invited were not worthy. Therefore, go into the highways, and as many as you find, invite to the wedding. So those servants went out into the highways and gathered together all whom they found, both bad and good, and the wedding hall was filled with guests. But when the king came in to see the guests, he saw a man there who did not have on a wedding garment. So he said to him, Friend, how did you come in here without a wedding garment? And he was speechless. Then the king said to the servants, Bind him hand and foot, take him away and cast him into outer darkness. There will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. For many are called, but few are chosen. And Revelation chapter 11 verse 1, Then I was given a reed like a measuring rod. And the angel stood saying, Rise and measure the temple of God, the altar, and those who worship there. 
And verses 18 and 19, The nations were angry, and your wrath has come, and the time of the dead that they should be judged, and that you should reward your servants, the prophets and the saints, and those who fear your name, small and great, and should destroy those who destroy the earth. Then the temple of God was opened in heaven, and the ark of his covenant was seen in his temple, and there were lightnings, noises, thunderings, an earthquake, and great hail. And Revelation 14, verses 6 and 7. Then I saw another angel flying in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach to those who dwell on the earth, to every nation, tribe, tongue, and people, saying with a loud voice, Fear God and give glory to him, for the hour of his judgment has come, and worship him who made heaven and earth, the sea and the springs of waters. The concept of a pre-Advent investigative judgment of God's people is grounded in three basic biblical teachings. One is the notion that all the dead, righteous and unrighteous, remain unconscious in their graves until the final resurrections, as you read in John 5, verses 25 to 29. Most assuredly, I say to you, the hour is coming, and now is, when the dead will hear the voice of the Son of God, and those who hear will live. For as the Father has life in himself, so he granted the Son to have life in himself, and has given him authority to execute judgment also, because he is the Son of Man. Do not marvel at this, for the hour is coming in which all who are in the graves will hear his voice, and come forth, those who have done good, to the resurrection of life, and those who have done evil, to the resurrection of condemnation." The second is the existence of a universal judgment of all human beings, as we read in 2 Corinthians 5.10 and Revelation 20 verses 11 to 13. Firstly, 2 Corinthians 5 verse 10, For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that each one may receive the things done in the body according to what he has done with a good or bad, in Revelation 20, verses 11 to 13. Then I saw a great white throne, and him who sat on it, from whose face the earth and the heaven fled away. And there was found no place for them. And I saw the dead, small and great, standing before God, and books were opened. And another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged according to their works, by the things which were written in the books. The sea gave up the dead who were in it, and death and Hades delivered up the dead who were in them, and they were judged, each one according to his works. The third is the fact that the first resurrection will be the blessed reward for the righteous, and the second resurrection will be eternal death for the wicked, as you read in John five twenty-eight to 29 Do not marvel at this, for the hour is coming in which all who are in the graves will hear his voice and come forth those who have done good to the resurrection of life, and those who have done evil to the resurrection of condemnation. And Revelation 20, verses 4 to 6, And I saw thrones, and they sat on them, and judgment was committed to them. Then I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded for their witness to Jesus, and for the word of God, who had not worshipped the beast or his image, and had not received his mark on their foreheads or on their hands. And they lived and reigned with Christ for a thousand years. But the rest of the dead did not live again until the thousand years were finished. This is the first resurrection. Blessed and holy is he who has part in the first resurrection. Over such the second death has no power, but they shall be priests of God and of Christ, and shall reign with him a thousand years. And verses 12 to 15, And I saw the dead, small and great, standing before God, and the books were opened. And another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged according to their works, by the things which were written in the books. The sea gave up the dead who were in it, and death and Hades delivered up the dead who were in them. And they were judged, each one according to his works. Then death and Hades were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death, and any one not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. What this means is that if all human beings will be judged, they should be judged prior to their respective resurrections, because at those resurrections they will receive their final rewards. 
The book of Daniel helps us to understand both the time and the nature of that pre-Advent judgment. At the end of the 2,300 symbolic days in 1844, the heavenly sanctuary would be cleansed and the pre-Advent judgment, investigative judgment, would begin. Two different ways of expressing the same event. Daniel 8 and verse 4. And he said to me, for 2,300 days, then the sanctuary will be cleansed. And we're comparing that with Hebrews 9, 23. Therefore, it was necessary that the copies of the things in the heavens should be purified with these, but the heavenly things themselves with better sacrifices than these. And Daniel 7, beginning at verse 9, I watched till thrones were put in place, and the Ancient of Days was seated. His garment was white as snow, and the hair of his head was like pure wool. His throne was a fiery flame, its wheels a burning fire. A fiery stream issued and came forth from before him. A thousand thousands ministered to him, ten thousand times ten thousand stood before him. The court was seated and the books were opened. I watched then because of the sound of the pompous words which the horn was speaking. I watched till the beast was slain and its body destroyed and given to the burning flame. As for the rest of the beasts, they had their dominion taken away, yet their lives were prolonged for a season and a time. I was watching in the night visions, and behold, one like the Son of Man, coming with the clouds of heaven. He came to the Ancient of Days, and they brought him near before him. Then to him was given dominion and glory and a kingdom, that all peoples, nations and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion, which shall not pass away, and his kingdom the one which shall not be destroyed." And the judgment is in favour of the saints of the Most High, we read in Daniel 7.22. That is, it's good news for God's people. We read earlier in Matthew 22, 1-14, Jesus spoke of an investigation of the wedding guests before the wedding feast actually started. And in the book of Revelation, the pre-Advent investigative judgment is referred to in the task of measuring those who worship in the temple of God, in Revelation 11, verse 1, and in the announcement that the hour of his judgment has come, in Revelation 14, 6-7. And we're going to compare that with Revelation 14 and verses 14 to 16. Then I looked and behold a white cloud, and on the cloud sat one like the Son of Man, having on his head a golden crown, and in his hand a sharp sickle. And another angel came out of the temple, crying with a loud voice to him who sat on the cloud, Thrust in your sickle and reap, for the time has come for you to reap, for the harvest of the earth is ripe. So he who sat on the cloud thrust in his sickle on the earth, and the earth was reaped. And so to finish today, how should our knowledge of a judgment in heaven impact how we live here on earth? Tuesday, December 20, the Millennial Judgment. The Bible tells us that at the second coming, one, both the living saints and the resurrected saints will meet the Lord in the air, as we read in 1 Thessalonians 4, 16 and 17, for the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And thus we shall always be with the Lord. And two, all the saints will be taken to heaven to abide in the heavenly dwelling places that he himself has prepared for them. As we read in John chapter 14 verses 1 to 3, Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you, and if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, there you may be also. And three... 
only at the end of the millennium will the new Jerusalem come down to this earth and become the everlasting home of the saints, as we read in Revelation 21, 1 to 3. Now I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the new heaven and the first earth had passed away. Also there was no more sea. Then I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people. God himself will be with them and be their God. And verses 9 to 11. Then one of the seven angels, who had the seven bowls filled with the seven last plagues, came to me and talked with me, saying, Come, I will show you the bride and the lamb's wife. And he carried me away in the spirit to a great and high mountain and showed me the great city, the holy Jerusalem, descending out of heaven from God, having the glory of God. Her light was like a most precious stone, like a jasper stone, clear as crystal. So, during the millennium, while this earth remains desolate, the saints will reign with Christ in heaven. As we read in Jeremiah 4, verse 23, I beheld the earth, and indeed it was without form and void, and the heavens, they had no light. And Revelation 20, verse 4, And I saw thrones, and they sat on them, and judgment was committed to them. Then I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded for their witness to Jesus and for the word of God, who had not worshipped the beast or his image, and had not received his mark on their foreheads or on their hands, and they lived and reigned with Christ for a thousand years. Read 1 Corinthians chapter 6 verses 2 and 3 and Revelation 20 verses 4 to 6 and 11 to 13. Why should the saints participate in the millennial judgment? So 1 Corinthians chapter 6 beginning at verse 2. Do you not know that the saints will judge the world? And if the world will be judged by you, are you unworthy to judge the smallest matters? Do you not know that we shall judge angels? How much more things that pertain to this life? And Revelation 20 verses 4 to 6, And I saw thrones, and they sat on them, and judgment was committed to them. Then I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded for their witness to Jesus and for the word of God who had not worshipped the beast or his image and had not received his mark on their foreheads or on their hands and they lived and reigned with Christ for a thousand years but the rest of the dead did not live again until the thousand years were finished this is the first resurrection blessed and holy is he who has part in the first resurrection over such a second death has no power but they shall be priests of God and of Christ, and shall reign with him a thousand years. And Revelation 20, verses 11 to 13. Then I saw a great white throne, and him who sat on it, from whose face the earth and the heaven fled away. And there was found no place for them. And I saw the dead, small and great, standing before God, and books were opened. And another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged according to their works by the things which were written in the books. The sea gave up the dead who were in it, and death and Hades delivered up the dead who were in them. And they were judged, each one according to his works. The whole judgment process is intended, one, to vindicate God's character against the accusations of Satan that God is unfair in the way he treats his creatures, two, to confirm the impartiality of the rewards of the righteous, three, to demonstrate the justice of the punishments of the wicked, and four, to dissipate all doubts that could lead toward another rebellion in the universe. In the pre-advent investigative judgment of the righteous, only the heavenly hosts are involved, as we read in Daniel 7, verses 9 to 10. I watched till the thrones were put in place, and the Ancient of Days was seated. His garment was white as snow, and the hair of his head was like pure wool. His throne was like a fiery flame, its wheels a burning fire. A fiery stream issued and came forth from before him. 
A thousand thousands ministered to him. Ten thousand times ten thousand stood before him. The court was seated, and the books were opened. But during the millennial judgment of the wicked and the fallen angels, the saints themselves also will participate. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 3. Do you not know that we shall judge angels? How much more things that pertain to this life? And Jude 6, And the angels, who did not keep their proper domain, but left their own abode, he has reserved in everlasting chains, under darkness, for the judgment of the great day. And Revelation 20, verse 4, And I saw thrones, and they sat on them, and judgment was committed to them. Then I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded for their witness to Jesus and for the word of God, who had not worshipped the beast or his image, and had not received his mark in their foreheads or in their hands, and they lived and reigned with Christ for a thousand years. And verse 6, or verse 5, but the rest of the dead did not live again until the thousand years were finished. This is the first resurrection. Blessed and holy is he who has part in the first resurrection. Over such the second death has no power, but they shall be priests of God and of Christ, and shall reign with him a thousand years. The pre-Advent investigative judgment began in 1844, when thrones were put in place. The court was seated and the books were opened, as we read before in Daniel chapter 7, verses 9 and 10. The millennial judgment, however, will start after the saints are taken to heaven and sit on thrones and the judgment is committed to them. Then, once more, the heavenly books are opened and the dead are judged according to their works, by the things which were written in the books, as we read in Revelation 20, verse 4, and in verse 12, let's have a look at Revelation 20 and verse 12. And I saw the dead, small and great, standing before God. The books were opened, and another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged according to their works by the things which were written in the books. This process provides an opportunity for the saints to evaluate the heavenly records and to see God's fair treatment in all cases. He not only rewards all human beings according to what they deserve based on their own decisions, but also explains to them why he does so. And so to finish today, what does it teach us about the character of God that before any of the sleeping lost are resurrected to face the second death, the saved will be involved in the judging process and no one will be punished until we, too, see the justice and fairness of God? Bring your answer to class on Sabbath. Wednesday, December 21, The Executive Judgment During the Middle Ages, there was a strong tendency to portray God as a severe, punitive judge. Today, the tendency is to describe him as a loving, permissive father who never punishes his children. Yet, love without justice will turn into chaos and lawlessness, and justice without love will become oppression and subjugation. God's judging process is a perfect blend of justice and mercy, both of which derive from His unconditional love. The executive judgment is God's final and irreversible punitive intervention in human history. Limited punitive judgments occurred, for example, in the casting out of Satan and his rebellious angels from heaven, recorded in Revelation 12, the driving out of Adam and Eve from the Garden of Eden in Genesis chapter 3, the Great Flood of Genesis chapter 6 and 7 and 8, the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah in Genesis 9 and Jude verse 7, 
the death of the firstborn in Egypt in Exodus 11 and Exodus 12, and the deaths of Ananias and Sapphira in Acts chapter 5. So, it is no surprise that there also will be an executive judgment of the wicked at the end of human history. Read 2 Peter chapter 2 verses 4 to 6 and 2 Peter chapter 3 verses 10 to 13. How do these texts help us understand the nature of the final executive judgment? How does that imply the idea of the completion of judgment as opposed to its going on forever, which would be a perversion of justice and not an expression of it? 2 Peter chapter 2 beginning at verse 4, For if God did not spare the angels who sinned, but cast them down to hell and delivered them into chains of darkness to be reserved for judgment, and did not spare the ancient world, but saved Noah, one of the eight people, a preacher of righteousness, bringing in the flood on the world of the ungodly, and turning the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah into ashes, condemned them to destruction, making them an example to those who afterward would live ungodly. And Second Peter chapter 3, verses 10 to 13. But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night, in which the heavens will pass away with a great noise, and the elements will melt with fervent heat. Both the earth and the works that are in it will be burned up. Therefore, since all these things will be dissolved, what manner of persons ought you to be in holy conduct and godliness, looking for and hasting the coming of the day of God, because of which the heavens will be dissolved, being on fire, and the elements will melt with fervent heat? Nevertheless, we, according to his promise, look for new heavens and a new earth, in which Righteousness dwells. God's goodness, Ellen White writes in Manuscript Releases, Volume 12, page 208, and long forbearance, his patience and mercy exercised to his subjects will not hinder him from punishing the sinner who refused to be obedient to his requirements. It is not for a man a criminal against God's holy law, pardoned only through the great sacrifice he made in giving his son to die for the guilty because his law was changeless, to dictate to God. End of quote. All that God could have done to save humanity from being eternally lost, he did, even at a great cost to himself. Those who are lost ultimately made choices that led them to this unfortunate end. The idea that God's judgment on the lost, even the annihilation of the lost as opposed to eternal torment, goes against the character of a loving God is simply wrong. It's God's love and God's love alone that demands justice as well. And so to finish the day, what does the cross itself teach us about what God was willing to do in order to save everyone who would be saved? Thursday, December 22, The Second Death God is leading human history towards its end-time climax. At the end of the millennium, all the wicked dead are raised from their graves to receive their final punitive sentences, as we read in Revelation 20 and verse 5. But the rest of the dead did not live again until the thousand years were finished. This is the first resurrection. And then verses 11 to 15, Then I saw a great white throne, and him who sat on it, from whose face the earth and the heaven fled away. And there was found no place for them. And I saw the dead, small and great, standing before God, and books were opened. And another book was opened, which is the book of life. 
and the dead were judged according to their works by the things which were written in the books. The sea gave up the dead who were in it, and death and Hades delivered up the dead who were in them, and they were judged, each one according to his works. Then death and Hades were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death, and any one not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. Then, when the whole judging process is completed and nothing else can be added to it, the wicked will acknowledge God's justice. Ellen White writes in The Great Controversy, pages 670 and 671, with all the facts of the Great Controversy in view, the whole universe, both loyal and rebellious, with one accord declare, Just and true are thy ways, thou King of Saints. And Satan himself bows down and confesses the justice of his sentence. End of quote. Read Malachi chapter 4 and verse 1, Revelation 20, 14 and 15, and Revelation 21 verse 8. How effective are the lake of fire and the second death? First of all, Matthew not Matthew, Malachi chapter 4 and verse 1. For behold, the day is coming, burning like an oven, and all the proud, yes, all who do wickedly, will be stubble. And the day which is coming shall burn them up, says the Lord of hosts, that will leave them neither root nor branch. And Revelation 20 verses 14 and 15. Then Hades and death were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. And anyone not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. And Revelation 21 verse 8. But the cowardly, unbelieving, abominable, murderers, sexually immoral, sorcerers, idolaters, and all liars shall have their part in the lake which burns with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. The final destruction of Satan and his angels and all the wicked will cleanse the universe from sin and its consequences. And yet, even the final destruction of the wicked is an act of God's love, not only for the saints, but also for the wicked themselves. They would rather die than live in the presence of God, who is a consuming fire for sin, as it says in Hebrews 12, verse 29. For our God is a consuming fire. And in the Great Controversy, page 543, we read, They, the lost, would long to flee from that holy place. They would welcome destruction, that they might be hidden from the face of him who died to redeem them. The destiny of the wicked is fixed by their own choice. Their exclusion from heaven is voluntary with themselves and just and merciful on the part of God. End of quote. Thus, the final annihilation of sin and sinners, in contrast to the unbiblical theory of their everlasting sufferings in hell, provides a just and proportional punishment for whatever evil people have committed. It also confirms that sin had a beginning and will have an end. Then the whole universe will return to its original perfection before sin. Evil and disobedience arose mysteriously and without any justification. Praise the Lord that he, as our righteous judge, as it says in 2 Timothy 4 verse 8, will make the fair decision of granting immortality to the righteous and eternal destruction to the wicked. 2 Timothy 4 verse 8 reads, Finally, there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord the righteous judge will give to me on that day, and not to me only, but also to all who have loved his appearing. So to finish the day, what would be wrong with the idea that God saves everyone in the end? Why is that such a bad idea? Friday, December 23. From the Desire of Ages, page 580, we read, In the day of final judgment, every lost soul will understand the nature of his rejection of truth. 
the cross will be presented and its real bearing will be seen by every mind that has been blinded by transgression. Before the vision of Calvary with its mysterious victim, sinners will stand condemned. Every lying excuse will be swept away. Human apostasy will appear in its heinous character. Men will see what their choice has been. Every question of truth and error in the long-standing controversy will then have been made plain. In the judgment of the universe, God will stand clear of blame for the existence or continuance of evil. It will be demonstrated that the divine decrees are not accessory to sin. There was no defect in God's government, no cause for disaffection. When the thoughts of all hearts shall be revealed, both the loyal and the rebellious will unite in declaring, Just and true are thy ways, thou King of saints. Who shall not fear thee, O Lord, and glorify thy name? For thy judgments are made manifest. Revelation 15 verses 3 and 4. End of quote. And that brings us to our three discussion questions for this week. 1. If you cling to self, refusing to yield your will to God, you are choosing death. To sin, wherever found, God is a consuming fire. If you choose sin and refuse to separate from it, the presence of God, which consumes sin, must consume you. That's a quote from Thoughts from the Mount of Blessing, page 62. How does this quote help us understand the nature of the executive judgment? 2. Dwell on the idea, presented at the end of Tuesday's study, that not one of the lost will face final judgment until after the redeemed have been part of the judging process. Again, what does this teach us about the openness and transparency of God? For a universe in which love reigns, why is this transparency so important? And 3. How will the participation of the saints in the millennial judgment comfort them in regard to their loved ones who will be lost? And now for Inside Story, a mission story with Sibella. Thank you, Sibella. Two Dreams in Angola by Andrew McChesney Every time he went to church, little William Frederico Joao Lombo seemed to hear the preacher say the same phrase. The big preacher stood behind the pulpit in the church in Angola. He raised a hand into the air and thundered, Those who do not live to serve God are not fit to live. The preacher's words made a big impression on his young mind. But the world outside the church also made a big impression, and he decided that he would rather dance than go to church. At age 14, he formed a dance group and performed at parties and school events in Angola's capital, Luanda. Even though William enjoyed dancing, something didn't seem right. He felt an emptiness inside, and he remembered the words of the preacher, those who do not live to serve God are not fit to live. The joy from dancing faded and William began to smoke and drink, but he felt increasingly empty. One day he prayed desperately, I'm not living to serve you and I am not fit to live. Help! Shortly after the prayer, a friend gave William a flash drive with a sermon on it. William wanted the flash drive because on it his friend also had saved a video of him dancing. The sermon touched William's heart. He fell to his knees and asked for forgiveness. He decided to go to church. All churches were closed in Angola because of COVID-19 and William ended up in an Adventist house church. A big surprise awaited William. The leader of the house church, Felipe, had had two dreams about William over the past two nights. In the first dream, Felipe was standing beside a big tree and in his hand he held a small branch. He needed to somehow connect the branch to the tree so it could grow again. In the second dream, Felipe was standing beside a big river. A small river flowed beside the big river and Felipe somehow needed to connect the small river to the big river. 
You are the small branch that needs to be connected to the big tree, Felipe told William. The big tree is Jesus, who is the tree of life. You are the small river, and the big river is Jesus. You need to be connected to Jesus, who is the river of life. William could scarcely believe his ears. Jesus wants me to be connected to him, he asked. As William worshipped at the house church, peace and joy began to fill the emptiness in his heart. He decided to be connected only to Jesus. Today, William couldn't be happier. He lives only to serve God. This lesson was read by Dr. Percy Harold for Christian Services for the Blind. Sponsored by the Sabbath School Department and distributed through Hope Channel Australia, this podcast is also redistributed by Hope Channel Germany, Christian Record Services for the Blind. It is also available on SoundCloud and through multiple podcast distributors, including Apple iTunes. And you can listen and watch at the same time on YouTube. Remember, God is always faithful.